So this is the chapter overview video for chapter 12, uh, static equilibrium and elasticity. So this week we are covering chapter 12 and chapter 13 kind of together. These are short chapters, so we cover them together in one week. Um, so it starts, chapter 12 starts out with a, a section 12.1, conditions for static equilibrium. And these are uh, simple two conditions. The first condition says that the net force is equal to zero. And the second condition says net torque is equal to zero. And these conditions are meant so that any acceleration um, uh, due to net force is zero. That's a one uh, condition for equilibrium. And, um, and I think we might have talked about dynamic equilibrium versus static equilibrium. The focus of this chapter will be static equilibrium. We're not really thinking about things moving at constant velocity. Um, well, they are moving at constant velocity of zero. <laughs> and uh, now that we have covered the rigid body motion, not only we care about acceleration, translational motion of an object, but we also worry about uh, rotation. So we are worried about rotational acceleration or angular acceleration. So that uh, accounts for the second condition we said, that net torque is equal to zero. And this second condition will lead to a lot of great, uh, interesting examples. Static equilibrium, even though it's a static, it actually, I think, it leads to a lot more interesting scenarios than some of the other Newton's law scenarios we've been dealing with. Um, and part of that is because it's uh, uh, when you set net force and net torque equal to zero, the resulting equations are simpler. Uh, which means uh, we can actually handle more complicated scenarios that we wouldn't have dared to try earlier because it'll just give you, you know, a system of six, seven, eight equations that's too tedious to solve for at our level. But with a static, static equilibrium, uh, the right-hand side being zero means we can consider more complicated um, condition, uh, situations involving more forces, more um, things, uh, um, interacting. So so you will see that. Uh, in fact, that's the next section, section 12.2. Uh, but let me just make sure there is no... These cross product stuff, um, we don't really focus on it. We'll deal with the uh, torque as being either clock, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise. That's the only sense in which you have to worry about. Um, the vector aspect of torque, we really deal with it when we are dealing with the angular momentum. You've seen that in the case of precession, that's really the only uh, scenario. So this would be one of the simpler scenarios involving static equilibrium, and you will see more complex scenarios later. Um, so yeah, this, um, this now deals with uh, you know, different angles. Um, and when you look at examples of static equilibrium, uh, you will now begin to see situations involving even more forces. And the problem-solving strategy, I guess your textbook is uh, um, spelling out something for static equilibrium. For us, our standard strategy will work for static equilibrium as well. The only thing that might be changing is that when you are defining the axis, because your acceleration is zero, you have complete freedom in choosing your axis. So we usually choose the access to minimize the number of forces that you have to break down into x and y component. And uh, I think some of the examples they show here illustrates that. Um, the balance, this is basically a one-dimensional problem because everything's nice and 90 degrees. Um, <laughs> and now I think the next example of yeah forces in forearm, this is an example where, so you could, you know, given this scenario, you can choose to use a straight axis. You have complete freedom to do that. And there might be a reason to do it because if you do it that way, then you know the, uh, the applied force, applied um, tension, weight, they are all in the vertical or what you might could have called Y direction if you define straight axis. Now, uh, when you do it that way, you will have to find the lever arm in a different way, the um, kind of, um, the perpendicular, yeah, I think the, yeah, the, the perpendicular component of displacement, you could do it that way. Now, in this textbook example, they are choosing to define their axis differently. They're choosing to define their axis along the arm, which will simplify consideration of the lever arm because, uh, or I guess the displacement, because they are basically going to use the displacement along that x-axis. And 
in the kind of the trade-off there is now they have to break down their force into the Y component and the X component. And you could totally do that, although I probably wouldn't choose to do that. Um, but I guess that actually, so no matter which uh, axis you choose, either straight axis or the tilted axis that they've chosen, I do think you have to end up breaking down equal number of vectors into components. So in this case, they're breaking down forces into two components. In the case where you choose the straight axis, you'd have to break down the displacement into components. So, um, so yeah, but these situations involving you know one, two, three forces, uh, it's rarer to see that um, outside the static equilibrium because things get complicated. But in static equilibrium, we feel we can do that because um, uh, it's uh, uh, mathematically a little bit simpler. So I think the next example is the example that I really like, which is yeah, leather resting against the wall. You will see a lecture demo. You will see a couple different analysis of it. I really like it because uh, if you imagine someone climbing the ladder, this actually changes dynamically. And um, I think at the beginning of the semester, I've told you that we ignore friction unless we can't. And this is a classic example of a case where you can't ignore friction. So if uh, this was frictionless down here, a ladder cannot rest against a wall. It would be sliding down. So, um, so, so you know, they do tell you about the uh, friction coefficient, and there are many different kinds of questions you can ask. Um, so in this particular scenario, what are they asking? Um, find the reaction forces from the floor and from the wall on the ladder. In the, yeah, so as this leans against the wall, the wall must be pushing on the ladder. That's the reaction force. And if uh, once you figure out the, there's a leftward force from the wall, then there must be a rightward force um, elsewhere. And the only place there can be is the floor. So there must be a friction force pushing it back. So that now that's not a reaction force. It's just two forces that are balancing each other out so that you have steady equilibrium condition. So there must be a friction force there. And that um, gives you a limit on what that coefficient of static friction has to be. So yeah. And in the lecture example, you will also see uh, how things change as someone climbs up the ladder. Uh, both the normal force and the friction force have to change as some of them climbs up the ladder. So I think that's uh, basically the examples. Do take a look at the textbook. I don't think there's uh, that big of a difference between your textbook approach and my approach. Um, now the next two, two sections, uh, what I would say is uh, skim through it, especially if you might go into civil engineering or like uh, experimental physics. Because the kind of the things that they cover here, Young's modulus, it is important um, in those fields. Like if you are building an experimental apparatus, it's uh, helpful for you to know that larger Young's modulus means um, smaller strain for a given amount of stress, which is like pressure, force. So, um, so it, it's helpful for you to know that larger Young's modulus means stiffer material. So uh, if you are building an experimental apparatus, it's uh, good for you to know what it means that aluminum has um, Young's modulus of you know, seven times that unit, uh, and steel or iron has Young's modulus of 20. So it has greater Young's modulus. And it, when you're building experimental apparatus, that, what that means is the aluminum parts will tend to bend more than steel parts would. Um, so that's good for you to know. And similar with uh, if you are a civil engineer, someone who's building a structure that might bend or you might have to worry about the forces involved with the thermal expansion, that sort of stuff. Now, with all that, uh, this is a topic we kind of skip. Um, you won't see a lot of questions in the uh, your homework set about or any questions about Young's modulus in your homework. So, um, uh, so you could skip it and there would be no harm done in terms of your being able to complete homework questions. Uh, so, but if, especially for those in the field of engineering, it's something good to know. So at least the scheme it, please. So that uh, if you later kind of uh, need to know what are the forces involved in things bending, then, then you know where to, bending or stretching, then you know where to go, where to look up the material, read through it more thoroughly so that you are well prepared.
So that is, um, that section. And the section on elasticity and plasticity, I think we skip it completely. Um, in fact, uh, for a long time, I di didn't quite know what plastic meant, as in like plastic behavior. I was confusing it with elastic. But anyways, uh, if you are interested, do read through it. But I think this topic, we completely skip it. You don't see me mentioning that all in, um, in my lectures. I don't think there's any homework question that addresses this. So, so, so that's it for chapter 12. That's uh, kind of what we cover in chapter 12 and what we don't cover in chapter 12. Um, do take a look at the chapter 12 uh, lectures and readings page, or I think a reading and lectures page, and uh, do watch through the lectures. Um, the approach there should be fairly consistent with what you see in the textbook.